Hello, and welcome to The Psychonaut Show with Dr. J.K.B. This is John K. Burton, M.D., psychiatrist, psychoanalyst. And on this podcast, your captain on these voyages to explore strange new worlds in inner space. Our mission is to uncover knowledge that will ultimately make us more effective, more connected, and more attractive in our daily lives. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the return of the repressed. I've always thought this concept sounds like some kind of B-horror movie, like Return of the Living Dead or Return of the Body Snatchers. Actually, Freud did write an essay called The Uncanny where he was trying to explain why we have feelings of horror or eeriness, and he used the concept of the return of the repressed to explain this. But let me tell you what it is. The idea is this, that at certain times in our life, and Freud was mostly talking about childhood, we will have a feeling or a thought or an idea that makes us very uncomfortable. It's our own thought or feeling, but we don't want to have it. We don't want to own it. So we repress it. And repression is an active force. It pushes things into the unconscious and and, and and it holds them there. So in our consciousness, we don't feel like we have that thought or feeling or idea. We don't feel like we own it, but it is there. And what happens is that at some other time, that repressed thought or feeling comes back in the form of a symptom or an anxiety or a problem And that's what the return of the repressed is. So I want to tell you about a case that came to me where the return of the repressed was a big part of the problem and also where understanding the return of the repressed helped us to solve that problem. So this is the case of a young man who came to me when he had dropped out of college and had to take a medical leave because of developing a major depressive episode. What had happened is he was a top player on his college basketball team and was very dedicated and also an excellent student. But during practice, he had sustained an injury that prevented him from playing out the rest of the season. As a result of that, he couldn't play basketball, he couldn't practice, and he lost his sense of himself It affected his academics. It affected his social life. He couldn't perform anymore. He couldn't function. And he ultimately had to take a leave of absence from college because of this. And he came to me for treatment. So as we talked, I came to learn about his family. And his family was very talented musically. Both parents were professional musicians. And he was the youngest of three boys. The two older boys each played an instrument very well. And each one had won competitions. And... One had gone to school um, in actually for conservatory. But my patient, as a young boy, had tried the trumpet at one point, and he didn't like that, so he quit it and picked up the saxophone. And he didn't like that either. And he went through a number of different trials of, of instruments and trying to make a stab at music like his family culture warranted. And as a result of this, trying one thing and dropping it and trying another thing and dropping it, he got the label of being a quitter. Like, you're not adequate, you can't stick with things, you always quit things. And it wasn't until later in his childhood, really in junior high school, beginning of adolescence, that he found basketball and he loved it and he was good at it and he was talented at it. It wasn't what his family did, but it was a thing that he derived an enormous sense of value from and he was driven and motivated to do this. And he felt good about himself from that. In fact, got into college with a basketball scholarship. So the return of the repressed, the repressed feeling was, I am a quitter. I'm inadequate. I don't stick with things. I'm not as good as everyone else. It was putting that out of his mind into unconscious that partly drove him to be so motivated with the basketball. The problem with that is that his motivation and his drive was in part based on fear. And that made him drive himself so hard that eventually he put himself in a situation where he got this injury and he ended up having to quit basketball. So the return of the repressed is 
the repressed I am a quitter came true when because of his injury, he actually had to quit. What happened in treatment, though, is because we were able to go back and see this and bring the unconscious repression, I feel like an inadequate quitter, into consciousness and as an adult put it in perspective and say, well, that's actually not true. I understand where that feeling comes from, but it's not relevant anymore. That is what began to help him come out of his depression, feel better about himself, acknowledge the actual achievements that he did have, distance himself from the feelings that he and the messages that he had gotten as a child, feel better and be able to return to school. So we can see how this concept of the return of the repressed is very useful right now in our current life. In fact, you really can see all of psychoanalysis coming from this basic concept. This concept Freud first introduced in 1896 when he was trying to understand the things that he was seeing in his practice in Victorian Vienna. And since then, he saw many things that it could apply to, including, as I mentioned, this feeling of horror that we get when we might see a film or read a scary story. Speaking of horror movies, one of the best descriptions of the return of the repressed that I have ever heard comes from the Guillermo del Toro movie, Mama, where one of the characters, in trying to explain what is happening in this film, says this, A ghost is an emotion bent out of shape, condemned to repeat itself time after time until it writes the wrong that was done. That is the return of the repressed. So I want to bring up another example of the return of the repressed, but this time I want to take it from the personal psychological level to the societal level. And I want to talk about the recent presidential election and how I think the idea of the return of the repressed can help us to think about what's going on in our country in a useful way. As we all know, a lot of polls were going around during the weeks and months and days leading up to the election, and most of them were predicting that Hillary Clinton would win, and a lot of the media was kind of, you know, following things, but, you know, really expecting that uh, Donald Trump would not win the election, and, you know, pretty secure that Hillary Clinton would, and particularly the Democrats were feeling very, uh, you know, confident about that, and the whole group of people that were in that mindset were feeling pretty clear about how things were going to go. And so on election night, it was a real shock to a lot of people when it became clear that Donald Trump was going to win the election. Votes from the state of Pennsylvania. We just got new metrics in. Donald J. Trump is the president of the United States elect. And my take in all of that is, is this, that there were forces going on in our country, just like there are forces that go on in our minds, and they make us uncomfortable and they make us scared and we push them out of our minds. And in this case, there were forces that were going on in our country that certain people also didn't want to think about. Yes, the Democrats and the media and the polls were aware that there was a level of anger I would even say rage going on in parts of the country because of how people were feeling about their situations for the last eight to 10 years. But the level of that rage was just not appreciated. Yeah, it's there, but it, we're still going to win. Well, actually, this is really a perfect example of the return of the repressed because we didn't appreciate how much anger and rage was actually there, despite the signs being there. And sometimes I mean literally the signs. I live in New York City, but I have a place upstate. And before the primaries, there were Trump signs and there were Bernie Sanders signs. After the primary, they were only Trump signs. There were no Hillary Clinton signs anywhere. But yeah, we justified this. We rationalized it. Oh, the people who vote for Hillary Clinton just don't put signs on the line. Well, no, that's not how it was. There was an antipathy towards the establishment that no one in that camp, anyway, wanted to pay attention to. And then a lot of people on election night were very confused, disoriented, depressed, despondent. And you repress these things, you don't pay attention to them, 
and then they come back in ways that are out of your control and change the course of events. You know, like with my patient who got an injury and he had to stop. He had to drop out of college. But there is a silver lining here. When you become conscious of what you have put into unconsciousness, when you become aware, then you have an opportunity. Even though you may be uncomfortable or even afraid, you have an opportunity to pay attention, to be conscious, to see and to confront. And then you have the power to actually be an active participant and do something about it. And I think that that's an opportunity that we have right now in this country. So I hope that you can see that this idea of Sigmund Freud's going way back to 1896 actually has significance right now in our modern life. It's an idea that he came up with in Victorian Vienna to describe what he saw happening in his patients back then with hysteria and conversion disorder and obsessional neurosis. But it actually, at its base, helps us understand things that happen with us personally and even things that happen on a larger scale, even with our country. And basically, the idea is this, that we feel things that make us uncomfortable or make us afraid and we want to push them out of our minds. And we do push them out of our minds. We keep them actively out of our awareness in order to not feel afraid, in order to not feel uncomfortable. But the irony, the Greek oracle phenomenon, as I call it, is that it does not go away. And in fact, our repression of it makes it come back and affect us in even more powerful and insidious ways. Like a horror movie, it haunts us. And if we can actually face that ghost, face those demons, and feel our fear, bring it into consciousness, then we can be in control. We can be in power and do something about the things that make us uncomfortable and make us afraid, rather than just feeling eternally haunted by them. This gives us the way back to finding our own power. This is Dr. JKB signing off. Since we are exploring together, you make the journey all the richer by subscribing to the show on iTunes. And even better if you also leave a rating. It helps others to find us. If you have a story about how the concept in this episode helped you figure out something in your life, send it in, please. You can also find me on Facebook and Twitter at Psychonaut Show. Show notes are on the website, thepsychonautshow.com. And if you leave me a question, it may well be an inspiration for an upcoming episode. Until our next trip, judge nothing, question everything. And remember, there's always a reason. Bye for now. The Psychonaut Show was created and produced by yours truly, John Burton. Art and web design by Hunter Creative. Post-production and sound design by Julio Gonzalez of Zimmer Media. Zimmer Media can be found online at zimmer.co. That's X-I-M-E-R dot C-O. 